Hello once again everyone, I'm your host Ray Shasha. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends. Vanilla Fudge was one of the first American groups to infuse psychedelia into a heavy rock sound to create psychedelic symphonic rock. An eclectic genre which would, among its many offshoots, eventually morph into heavy metal. Although at first the band did not record original material, they were best known for their dramatic, heavy, slowed down arrangements of contemporary pop songs, which they developed into works of epic proportions. Vanilla Fudge celebrated their 50th anniversary in 2017 and are still rocking the world in the current day with one of their greatest hits, You Keep Me Hanging On, which was featured in the Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Please welcome lead vocalist, keyboardist, composer, and arranger for classic rock legends Vanilla Fudge, Mark Stein, to interviewing the legends. Hello, Mark. Hello, how are you? Very pleasant, good day. Hope everybody's safe and doing okay. Exactly. Well, the last time we chatted, Mark, was in March of 2018, uh, Spirit of 67, Vanilla Fudge, and then the Mark Stein Project. So it's it's been a while. We need to catch up. Yeah. Yeah, right. Cool. Yeah. I just talked to Arthur Brown recently. He's 80 now, and he mentioned wow. Vanilla Fudge. And I told Arthur, I said, you know, you and Vanilla Fudge don't seem to age, man, after all these years. And I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's crazy. Arthur Brown, man. I played on a track uh, called Zombie Yelp, which is, if anybody checks that out, you should Google it. It's like a spooky Halloween track that Arthur wrote and recorded and he had me do some hamming on it. And it's really a creative track, it, you know, Zombie Yelp. So check that one out by Arthur Brown and me on keyboards. You're talking about the crazy world of Arthur Brown, 1967, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This band, this crazy band opened for Vanilla Fudge when we had a big album going. And, and you know who was playing drums in that band at that time? Um, let's see. Co uh, yeah, the um, guy from ELP. Right, Carl Palmer. Carl Palmer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As, as a matter of fact, he toured with uh, Carl Palmer uh, not that long ago. They did a, uh, right. yeah, very cool. I'm telling you, man, you guys don't age. I've had Carmine on many times, and all of you guys, except for Carmine's letting his hair go white now, that's about it. Yeah, but, it looks cool, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, he does look cool, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, I like it, yeah. Well, we ran out of merch money, so we couldn't afford the uh, hair dye anymore. <laughs> that's, so. that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make two statements about this album, okay? It's called Vanilla Zeppelin. I gave it five stars, and I'm going to tell you why exactly I made these two statements, okay? Um, first, first one is Vanilla Fudge are the kings of reinventing cover songs. These brand new interpretations of Led Zeppelin classics are ingenious and inspiring and should be revered by the true rock historian. Incredible music artistry. And uh, Mark Stein's vocals really shine on this album. Uh, the second statement, you guys are the true masters of the cover song. The listener will be pleasantly surprised by the direction each track will lead them. Do not expect a clone Zeppelin album because that's not what makes a great cover song. And that's not what Vanilla Fudge is all about. Now, I made that statement because I saw some reviews that I did not like about the album that they wanted kind of a clone Zeppelin, and I even wrote back to these reviewers, and I, I let them have it, man. <laughs> yeah. Because that's not oh, what it's I all mean, about. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate all your positive comments on it. I mean, we actually recorded that album back in 2006. Really? Out in L.A., yeah, out yeah. in L.A., and uh, it's been kind of sitting in the can, and... I guess uh, an Australian company, Golden Robot, picked it up and right. you know, decided they wanted to put it out and distribute it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of you know vocal performances on there. A bunch of the arrangements are pretty cool. Um, I think it's stood the test of time, and it's gotten you know when it came out, it, it got some pretty positive reviews. And uh, yeah, and it, well, one of the songs, uh, "Days Are Confused," is. Uh, Really, probably my favorite because we do that one live and it always goes over really well. You know, we do our concerts and I told a story about when Jimmy Page left the Art Birds, came to America with three unknowns, you know, Plant mm -hmm. um, and uh, John Paul Jones and you know Bonzo, John Bonham. Um, we were label mates and they 
kind of for us when we were, you know, at a heyday when we had like all kinds of albums and singles all over the charts. And then, you know, the first gig they did was uh, opening for Vanilla Farts in uh, Denver in uh, 68. I think it was December of 68. So, uh, you know, we tell the story about it. Now we did the first couple of tours together and we, uh, you know, got to know each other as kids and I, I saw them grow into this incredible juggernaut almost overnight and uh but i tell that story and uh, the song goes over really well and there's your you know lead in your correlation to uh this uh, zevlin trivia album that we did uh, you know i love this album because I'll be honest with you, I've been listening to Zeppelin for 50 years now, and I've been listening to the Beatles for 50 years, and I welcome anything that's different. You know, I, you got to admit, you get tired after a while. How much How much can you listen to the same songs over and over and over again, you know? And yeah. what, one thing, I, I was a top 40 DJ back in the late 70s, and I played all of my love to death. And I really didn't like the song from Zeppelin. And you guys' twist on that song made me really, really like that song. It's I think oh, it sounds cool. I think it sounds better than Zeppelin, much better than Zeppelin's uh, song. Well, uh, okay, well, appreciate that, but uh, what can I say? Uh, I, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a nice tune. We kind of do a, our interpretation of it, and right. uh, you know, the critics. Like it if they don't mm -hmm. like it because it isn't a clone. Well, nothing I can do about it. We we'll just do our thing, you know. <laughs> you, you know, if you're going to do a, a song, a cover tune, just like Zeppelin, you might as well watch, go and see a tribute band at a club or something. You know, that's it. Right. That's not the point, right? Yeah. Well, we did the record. I remember because the whole key was we were trying to look for some kind of a hook. Right. Because Zeppelin, Zeppelin, Fudge had had an early history together, so we thought it'd be a good idea to. To do, a, you know, our interpretations of the, of, of uh, Zeppelin songs, and we all were asked to pick the songs that we liked. And uh, "Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You" is another tune that that we kind of do live too. It's kind mm -hmm. we kind of do a medley with, uh, you know, uh, with the other tune, and, uh, and 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 the crowd really likes it, and I enjoy singing it. Um, I kind of wrote this arrangement on the grand piano, actually. And uh, but we play it live on, on the Hammond, and uh, but it goes over really well. That's one of my again. It's one of my favorite things. Babe, I'm going to leave you, which is uh, in the middle of uh, Days and Confused, which is pretty cool, very dynamic. So uh, exactly, you know, come and check it out if you see the fights playing. You know, you better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you guys play before, and you guys are incredible in concert, man. You know, I saw. I guess I saw you in, Ta in uh, Clearwater. I think it was at uh, Ruth Eckert, Ruth Eckert Hall there. Oh yeah, it's a great venue. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are cool. incredible. Uh, what one? One of the um, you know, you did a great version of Dancing Days. That was cool. I like the beginning of that. Kind of sounded a little Hendrix, a little Lenny Kravitz in a way. Yeah. You okay. know. Cool. Yeah. I have to revisit that because I haven't really listened to that in quite a while. Yeah, I mean, you, your voice is incredible. You got a great voice, man. You, I think you're a little underrated when it comes to you know, because I you you got a terrific voice. Oh, thanks. I just got to hire a better publicist, I guess. You know. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'll promote the hell out of you, man. <laughs> Um, like you said, Days and Confused, which has a kind of a spooky beginning. <laughs> you know, it was kind of neat. I like the way you, you did that. Um, Trampled Underfoot reminded me a little of Aerosmith for some reason. I don't know why. They had that wah-wah beginning, and then, I don't know, the vo yeah. vocals reminded me of Aerosmith. And, of course, you know, uh, Carmine's going to love doing Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's that's his thing, man. Yeah. Power drums, he was one of the innovators for John Bonham. and yeah. A lot, a lot of history there, for sure, yeah. Exactly. Um, All of My Love was a very vanilla fudge feel to it, which which I liked, you know. Uh, okay. You know, I, I just love that track. Um, Fool in the Rain, another one. Uh, another That was another song I really never really got into that you guys turned it around and made me love, love the song. So, yeah, you guys... Five stars, man, for that album. And anybody that doesn't like that album is a total idiot. It doesn't know anything about music. <laughs> well, I mean, 
the ace to his own, you know. I've seen real good reviews on it. And I've right. Seen otherwise, and uh, you know, if you're a true Led Zeppelin fan, you know, I might get turned off by it. But if you're a true Vanilla Vice fan, and turned on by it, so um, and maybe we'll land this plane somewhere in the middle down the road, you know. Well, I told, I, I mentioned to this guy that you know that had that review. I said, you know, Zeppelin turned their uh, these you know these legendary. Uh, blues guys, you know, uh, into their style and didn't even give them any credit in the beginning. So don't give me this stuff about wanting to sound exactly like Led Zeppelin. I mean, you, you know, it, these are guys that just don't know about uh, music. They really don't. You know, they don't They do not do their due diligence as far as studying the uh, the background and, and all that yeah. good stuff. And you guys, you guys influenced, and you know, I always knew you guys influenced Deep Purple. That was a gimme because you know they they always um, John Lord always mentioned you guys in all the bios and stuff that they it was you that really turned them on yeah. to their sound. You know, yeah, John was a great dude, man. You know, we uh, we, were, we were like uh, very well acquainted. We were friends, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, too bad he. Uh, had passed on like that. Actually, he was just about ready to do an interview for my book, and uh, all of a sudden I didn't hear from him. I thought, well, maybe he changed his mind, but then I uh, found out, obviously, later he was sick, and then he ultimately passed on. Yeah. But, uh, but he was an amazing uh, rock organ player and, uh, you know, trained classical, you know, keyboardist. He did so many great things with orchestras, and he was uh, the, he was a real gentleman. He mm -hmm. was a very cool guy, and uh, I'm just I think the, the last time I saw him was in actually in Sunrise, Florida. I think I went by to see the guys when Purple they were playing there. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of hung out. That was so, that was quite a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, then another time I went to see Purple. They were playing at uh, Pompano uh, Amphitheater outside. That was also a number of years ago, and uh, Don Airy, who was right. a great keyboard player. He, yeah. he invited me up on stage to play Smoke on the Water. I said, you know, I never played that song, but man, that would be cool as hell. So uh, I just kind of like woodshed it real quick behind the scenes. went up and, uh, man, we rocked the house that night. It was, like, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> it was so much fun playing Smoke on the Water with Deep Purple. Very cool. And that ultimately led to uh, the manager asking me to get the fight together to open for them at Radio City Musical about oh, a awesome. week later. Yeah. They like that story. <laughs> Man, what a billing, huh? Uh, Fudge yeah, and Purple cool. together? Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. All, you, all you need to add to that would be Uriah Heep, the other band that uh, kind of was influenced by yeah. you guys. <laughs> yeah. I had, Fox is a friend of mine, you know, the original guitar player. Oh, Mick? Yeah, I, oh, I know Mick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. He's a cool good guy. guy. Yeah. I, I actually had Ken on the show, Ken Hensley, before he passed oh, away, God too. Soul, yeah. He was cool. He was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Another great band, you know, that um, kind of yeah, fell man. apart. At, you know, they, I mean, they had so many different lineup changes. and But, I, I you know, I like the original the original guys. That's why I love so much about you guys, because you kept the, uh, the core of the band together for so many years, you know, the main guys. You know? Yeah, yeah. Three out of four original members. That's so, for sure. That's hard to do. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, it, it hasn't been easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. T talk about that. Yeah. You you played the um, with the Sea of Tranquility Fall Fest. What what was that like? Well, where was that? It was uh. Let's say in uh, is it Poughkeepsie, New York, or? Oh yeah yeah yeah. October. Well, you know what? I I think that's kind of a conversation we should just delete if you don't mind because that wasn't uh, that was uh, kind of a weird night that night all the power went out oh really huh it was just like uh, yeah it's just really something that's not even worth discussing to be honest with you wow yeah it had a lot of different yeah. groups on that I think Nectar was on there and some other bands and... yeah and I think they blew out the PA just before we got there oh gosh there was no PA and then they had to move everything to a small stage and they had no equipment it was just it was a crazy night. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely other shows worth talking about, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, well, I brought that up because it was kind of like a festival or something, right? Because it had some other, you know, you know yeah, well-known well, bands. Yeah, it that way, but uh, it really didn't come off that way. 
But there were some other really good shows on that tour. We played uh, uh, like uh, the Narrows Art Performing Arts Center in Massachusetts. We had a lot of people there. That was a really good show. Mm -hmm. Real good show. And Paul Billowitz, the great guitar player with Carl Palmer's band, showed up. He's a friend of mine, and uh, it was a nice night. And uh, Bull Run, you know, in uh, right. Massachusetts as well. It was just a cool small place where we sold that out. and. It was a lot of it was a lot of fun that night. Uh, we had some real, we had some good shows on that run, and then unfortunately, uh, I had to cancel the last two shows. I came down with the flu. Huh. I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, about nine days ago. Yeah, it was just horrendous. Did you get the flu shot? I did not, but I've never <laughs> had the flu in my life. You know? Oh man! <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm still kind of feeling the effects of it actually a little bit. I mean, I'm a lot better. But yeah, that was a drag. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. That yeah. oh. that and the, the, the leftover COVID stuff that's out there, you know, still bothering people, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's still out there, man. Yeah. It is, it is. Yeah. I, I got all my shots and all the boosters. I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> yeah, well, I got my COVID shots. Yeah. Boosters, but uh, I never got a flu shot Yeah, in my life. The reason I didn't do it because two people that I did know that I had it, got so super sick from it, I just, you know, I don't know, I never had it. Wow. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of craziness on that run, I guess I got a little run down, mm -hmm. and uh, whatever happens, you know. Yeah. You got you got a couple of dates coming up, don't you? You got in November? Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm playing Westbury Music Fair with the Rascals. You ever hear of that band, the Rascals? The Rascals? Yeah. Yeah, of New course. Band on the scene. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, I know the Rascals. I, I, I had um, what's his name on the on the show. Uh, God. Felix. Yeah, Felix. I had Felix on the show. Yeah, good guy. Really nice guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Felix is one of my early mentors on the Hammond B3 when I was a teenager. Yeah, yep. sure. Yep. Did you, did you grow up in New York? I grew up in Jersey. Oh, uh, in Jersey. Okay. All right. I'm a Jersey guy, but spent a lot of time. Uh, I grew up in Bayonne, New Jersey, in Jersey City, so I was called it the Jersey side of New York. You know? Right, right. Spent a lot of, got a lot of, spent so much time in the city. Mm hmm You know, witnessing so much music growing up, so yeah. Yeah, we were on the same circuit. I grew up in, D, in the D.C. area, so, you know, D.C., New York, Philly, that was the, uh, the regular right. circuit for all the concerts and stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we got to see great music growing up. We really did. Yeah, it really was an awesome time. It really was. There was just so many great players and so many inspiring styles and creativity in the late 60s and 70s and 80s. And, yeah, so we were fortunate to uh, be born out of that era. You, you, you were actually on a TV show in D.C. when you were young, right? With Sam Cooke? Oh, my God. Yeah, I was <laughs> 11 years old. Wow. What, what show was that? Um, you remember? Um, I think it was called the Milk Grant Dance Party. Look, right. Look, 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 hey, look at the big brain on Marky. Um, a line from Pulp Fiction. <laughs> uh, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sam Cooke was on the show. and uh, uh, Lane hey, Newton? Doc, Wayne Newton was on the show. Yeah. Yeah, he was 16, I think. Yeah, Doc was saying, and I had a song called... Uh, Give me a chance. It was written by Neil Bogart. Wow. When he was 18. Neil, Neil Bogart later became the, uh, the head of Casablanca Records and launched the careers of uh, Donna Summer and Kiss and That's right. Village People. Yeah. You know, in the 70s. And uh, we were like childhood, kind of childhood friends way back. So, yeah, it's been an interesting trip. It's all in my book. You keep me hanging on. The raising story of rock music's golden age. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to check it all out, it's on Mark-Stein.com or Amazon. Uh, interesting stuff. 50, 60 years of rock history. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to mention your book. I, people need to buy your book as well. Um, it, 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 and for, but first, before I talk about that, I want to talk about There's a Light. This is your actually your first solo album, which I'm amazed. How come you never did a solo album before? Well, it's the first solo album that was actually on a label. I, I, right. I had a solo album you know, a number of years back. Okay. 
Uh, actually, I had two. Uh, one was on Columbia in 79. It was never released. It was produced by Dave Mason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's got a great theme, and you got your hero, one of your heroes, like you mentioned, People Gotta Be Free. You got a Rascals cover on there, yeah. which is incredible. Did a great job on that. Thank you. Yeah, but the, the, the theme, I mean, We Are One, you know, it's slow opening, beautiful track. Kind of reminded me of a Peter Cetera Chicago type, you know, slow song. Yeah, you well, know? I wrote that song we were about five weeks into the pandemic. Right. I guess it was uh, April of... Uh, 2020, and I was just kind of sitting at my piano, and this idea just came. It just, I just started singing this song out of nowhere. My wife, Patty, said, Man, that sounds beautiful. Don't stop, keep going, you know? Exactly. And the, the, the song We Are One, you know, Under God, Under the Sun, and it's just, uh, you know, here we are, battening down the hatches, afraid to shake our neighbor's hand or hug our children. What's the plan to survive, remember? Remember when the pandemic first came out? Remember the state of disbelief everybody was in? This yeah. really can't be happening, but actually, as each day went on, the reality became more and more evident, and it was a horrible, scary time, and I just kind of thought, mm -hmm. like, man, this is kind of some kind of spiritual karmic event. Right. You know, we had so many chances to spread some love and human kindness all of our lives, but what did we do? Yeah. You know, we created the divide, or it's this uh, inhumane things that are going on in the world. We yeah. survived the uh, storms, hurricanes, and you know social unrest and civil rights, and God was God knows what. You know, and we still never learn to respect and love one another in the true sense of the word. Uh, I guess, and I, I just look like that. This pandemic was like a, some kind of a karmic thing. Yeah, you know, I, that, that's what that's how it came out. You yeah. know, and uh, I just followed it. And I wrote the song and. Uh, there you go, you know. It's it's incredible. I I love the message in, in each and every track and you know, if anybody knows about the sixties and, and the differences between the sixties and now it's you. And also me, I mean I was a kid but I you know, I grew up working in my dad's store in DC on Neff Street, a couple blocks from the White House, and I saw the marches, you know, the, the hippies marching yeah. against Vietnam and I, mean, I saw it all back in the 60s, and we went through the 68 riots. We had to, you know, uh, take all those, the merchandise out of the window, and, and a lot of stores got burnt out and, and things like that. But the 60s was not a bad time, like people say. It was, a, it was a, actually a, a great time, in my opinion, because there was a mutual respect between the races back then, you know, and, and there was, you know, if you were cool anyway, which, you know, and there was a lot of peace and love, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, there were bad things like the assassinations, but I remember good times in the 60s, you know, and especially the music, you know, the music was incredible. Well, it was a glorious time, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, I mean, you know, especially if you were in a, you know, in a rock band that was on the top of the charts, it was amazing. Exactly. Um, but, uh... Yeah, I mean, like you say, uh, I just remember when Martin Luther King was assassinated. We, uh, when all the fights dedicated, people get ready right. to him, and well, we were we were really popular in those days. We were, I think, we were playing at the New Orleans Sports Arena. Mm -hmm. There were so many people there, and then after I dedicated it to him, they started throwing Molotov cocktails out of the stands and screaming. It was crazy. My manager came up to me and said, "What are you out of your mind? You were playing in the Deep South. You do something like that." Mm -hmm. You know, I said, hey, I'm just following my heart. You know? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, the younger generation were hugging me for it, and uh, mm -hmm. the business people were, you know, kind of pissed about it. But, hey, right. 
right? You know, I, I don't know. I've always kind of been an activist throughout my life. I think especially when I was younger. Um, man, I was on a plane with Dr. King once in San Diego, believe it or not. Wow, really? Flying from LA, from, oh. flying from LA to San Diego. He happened to be on board. That was pretty wild. Did you get to uh, talk to him? No, I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I didn't even really know he was on board. Or, Right. The plan landed and said, everybody wait, you know. And then I, I, I kind of walked off and I saw him standing by all these, uh, you know, TV cameras and mm -hmm. lights and stuff. I said, I'll be damned. He was on board up in the front. I never even knew that. It's pretty wild, yeah. His son was a customer of mine. And I also, yeah. I was good friends with Dick Gregory, who was, you know, him. Uh, right. Yeah, he's sure. a real activist. Nice guy, though. He used to buy a lot of micro tape recorders for me and spent a lot of money. <laughs> he was a good guy, though, Dick Gregory. Oh. Yeah, but we were we were very, yeah we were very much involved in all that. You know, of course in D.C. You know, with everything, a lot of a lot right. of stuff happened back then. But uh, I love your messages in these songs. Uh, we are survivors. Um, which sounded a little bit like Cream in a way. I don't know why. I don't know where I got that vibe from. Yeah, well, you know, I, I kind of wrote that song. Um, we Are Survivors. Uh, I wrote it for a movie called Rock on the Wall. Which right. Is a movie about about rock's influence on the fall of the Berlin Wall and communism. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the song was initially written about. I was imagining how you know people were for the last century behind the you know you know the kind of communism on the back for so long. Right. So that's what those lyrics reflect, and <laughs> actually it's relevant to a lot of stuff in this country right now, too, if you really listen. So. Exactly. Yeah, I just sang that song in Chicago huh. about a month ago. I did a solo show with uh, Jim Peterick, you know, from yeah. the Guys of March. Yeah, and, yeah uh, I, I had him on the show not long ago. He's a good guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It was written, you know, I had a tiger, and Yep. I did a show, uh, a solo show with that band Back Me Up in, in, uh, in uh, Illinois. And mm -hmm. I had uh, Jennifer Batten, a guitar player, played with Michael Jackson for so many years. And right. Guys of March, a lot of great players. It was a really cool concert. Huh. It was a lot of fun, yeah. So I did, uh, I did We Are Survivors, and the uh, band, they, they kicked it, man. They rocked it. Yeah. They really dug it, so it was cool. They've always been a great band, Guys of March. Yeah, a lot of great players. You know, he he's a, he's a great dresser too, man. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple, couple of the other lyrics, uh, racism. Very very cool lyrics on that one, as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, like you said, yeah. it hits hard today. All lives matter. Another another great song with. Uh, and who plays the guitar on that? That and, and also on the album. Who who is your guitar player? Um, on All Lives Matter, that's uh, Stephen Diakoudis, Stevie D. who okay. has got a studio in Jersey called The Sound Spy. He's a really good friend of mine. Yeah. He's a really talented player and producer. And, you know, actually he, uh, he co-produced most of the songs on, on that uh, There's a Light album with me. He, he's great. Yeah. Great guitar player. Yeah, hang on. Sorry about that. Yeah, Stevie D is really mm -hmm. cool. He is. He's, he's a really talented player. Yeah. Let's pray for Actually, peace. Actually, on that song, We Are One, there's only two people on that track, me Re and him. Really? You're kidding me. Just two, yeah, it sounds like a big you know, production to the two of us. It does. <laughs> yeah. uh, break It Down, another cool track. Um, did, now, did you write Break It Down? Yes, I did. That's a great tune, man. You know, I... Yeah, I always compare songs to some other bands just in my head, and I, I don't know why I heard Spooky Tooth a little bit in that, in that track, you know. But oh, yeah, yeah. Right, old man. Yeah, but it's a, a great song, man. You're you're a great lyricist too, besides having a great voice. Thanks, man. You know, your solo is we got a piano. I mean, you should be like huge with with your songwriting talents, you know. You really should be. I mean, I don't know if you want to. Sometimes you got to sell out a little bit to get commercialized. But I don't know. Is that would you not go that direction to try to get stuff on the radio or? Well, you can't get anything on the radio anymore. You know. Yeah. Cat, me, a cat from my ear. We just don't get played. That, that just, they just won't. I know a lot of program directors out there, and they 
you know, they just they can't play anything from classic rock artists that are new. They have to stick to the old. I know the, the same old, same old. The old formats, you know, which you I know, hate. It's really hard. Yeah, you know. I mean, some of the biggest artists from my era put albums out and hardly sold anything, and hardly get any airplay. I know. know? <clears throat> that's what the world now. That's yeah. why. That's why I still exist after all these years. Eleven years now, I've been promoting the great artists, the legends, you know, and then I, I promote the heck out of them because, like you said, the radio's not going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, well, we appreciate that, dude. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, if you teamed up with somebody, you know, in the modern world, I guess uh, that are you know a commercial artist. That's probably your best bet, you know, like doing a duo or something like that with somebody. Yeah, well, it's like that thing I just did, the world stage, and uh, I'm trying to get some of my songs in some movies, you know. But, right. Uh, I got a company that likes some of my stuff on this album that you're talking about. There's a light. There's a few tunes that are up for. Good. Up for, up for, you know, I can't be specific right now, but uh, right. yeah, I'm working on that. <clears throat> Yeah, movies. Yeah, really. yeah, and the other thing, video games. People are making some bucks on video games now, on the music on video games. You know, it's different, very different. But you know what? You keep banging on. It was like a big track in that Quentin Tarantino movie. Right. right? That's right. Once upon a time in Hollywood. Yeah. That was the top. It's really. I mean, it really introduced Mel Fudge to to the modern era. Exactly. I saw that movie. A lot of people never, the younger generation never heard of us, and and it really helped our loyalties. To be honest, uh, I was really grateful, you know, for that. And uh, Tarantino was a Fudge fan and mm -hmm. a fan of that era, so he did his own edit. But uh, yeah, that really helped our uh, raise our profile a lot. So I was grateful for that for sure. After all these years, you know. Yeah. And you know, you, you guys are, I mean, so talented. I mean, you know, Carmine's everywhere, you know. Um, of course, his brother Vinny as well. Um, yeah. You know, and um, another guy that doesn't get a lot of um, recognition really is your guitar player. After all these years, you know, Vince. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he he doesn't get mentioned that much, really. <clears throat> Yeah, Vinnie Martell. Yeah. And he's an excellent guitar well, player. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, he's a really tasty player, you know. He's, uh, uh, I mean, he kind of came up at the time, Paige and Beck and Clapton were like right. at the forefront of everything. And Noel Farge is basically a keyboard, heavy rhythm section band. Yeah. And Vinny, Vinny style guitar player was really perfect. You know, for the fudge, because you know, he kind of played, you know, complimented the orchestra, like an orchestra, the way he played, you know, his, his rhythms and, and what have you. It, it just worked. The chemistry was there. But, you know, again, uh, they came up at a time when uh, those cats were getting all the attention. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But that was you know, one of the factors right there. See, that's, uh, that's a shame. That's one thing I don't like about... I, I never liked Rolling Stone magazine. You know, they bash a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of them, they, they stick to the same guys over and over again. You know, it's, it's kind of like even the Grammy Awards at one time stuck with Stanley Clark over and over again. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, they need to venture out and, and learn the business. They, learn, they, you know, they need to learn about music. They need to learn about the past. You know, you got to be a historian to learn about music. You know, you can't just push Zeppelin and the Beatles. Zeppelin and the, you know, uh, you know. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of talent out there that doesn't have, that doesn't get recognized. It's a shame. It's somewhat recognized. It's a shame. Yeah, you know, I love. I like the Beatles too, but enough is enough. I, I I really mean that. I don't listen to the Beatles anymore. I can't take it anymore. They're just so so over talked about. And and I'll be honest with you, I don't think they were great musicians compared to a lot of other bands. I really don't think so. And and I always wondered why did George Harrison? Why did they always have um, Clapton back them up? There's got to be a reason for that, you know. They always bring in Clapton. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe they, you know, Harrison wasn't that great of a guitar player. And you know, he he I think he even admitted it at one time. 
you know, because he didn't practice. Well, it wasn't so much, you know, it wasn't really so much his greatness as a guitar player. It was the presence that he brought to the band. Yeah. You know, the vocals, his image, his songwriting. I mean, the Beatles collectively were, I mean, they changed the world. They just started a whole new culture. I mean, that's a whole... There's a whole other ball game yeah. you're talking about. You yeah, know, that's true. That they came along, and I mean, all the Claptons and all the great musicians, they all hung out together, they all complimented each other on different projects. I just saw George on, uh, uh, you know, um, My Guitar Gently Weeps with Clapton. He was just, he sounded great singing it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, uh, you know, Jeff Lynn and then Elton John was on there and Clapton. And, the whole band, it was just gave you chills. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it was just really terrific, you know. And I'm, I never heard him sing so, so so well like he did on that. I guess it was you know years ago at Madison Square Garden, one of those big venues. But I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I yeah, saw so. I, I saw Harrison. Uh, his voice was uh, he he had problems with his voice when I saw him in concert. Uh, it was yeah. probably the last big tour he did. Uh, but yeah, something was wrong with his voice at that time, and he kept cracking, you know. But uh, you know, the Beatles got a lot of their stuff. If you listen to the early, you know, like um, Little Richard and and those guys, you can hear the Beatles in their early music. You know, it, it's yeah. that's where it came from. You know, all that stuff. You know, Chuck Berry and you know the, all those early early the early guys, the, the real early right. guys. You know, so. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's just that sometimes they turn the Beatles into a religion, and you know, you got to be re you know sometimes you got to be realistic about things, you know, and just you know let let's listen to some other music, you know, let's concentrate on some other stuff, and that's sometimes you know that that's why I got mad about Vanilla Fudge and that reviewer. Well, it's kind of like the guy that sells what's his name that's on TV on Super Heavy Rotation, it's the Pillow Guy, <laughs> constantly on and on and on. Give somebody else a chance. <laughs> I don't like that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, why, why was the mute button invented? Uh, you, know? you know, I tried his pillow on. It sucks. <laughs> That's what I heard. I got a bad <laughs> neck, so I, I know about pillows. <laughs> yeah. His pillow sucks, man. Uh, I just yeah. want to mention one last song on this thing. I know we're running close to the end of the interview. but Yeah, I got to do this other thing coming. I just want to say how, how much I enjoyed America the Beautiful. Uh, your voice was incredible. It reminded me a lot of Ray Charles, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, I was inspired by him, yeah. Oh, man. You did, a, you did a wonderful job on that. You really did. And I gave, I gave your solo album five stars because it deserves it. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, man. Uh, cool. Here's your final question real quick. If you had a, I've asked you this before. If you had a Feel the Dreams wish like the movie, um, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? The past or present? Jeez, I don't know. Maybe Elvis Presley. Oh, really? That's cool. I never met Elvis Presley. How cool would that have been? Yeah, that would have been awesome. You playing well, organ and him singing? Or both of you kind of harmonizing yeah, together? Yeah, I would like to sit and hang out with him and maybe write something together or say yeah. something together, you know. That would be cool. Yeah, I don't get a lot of people saying Elvis. I, the number one answer I usually get is Paul McCartney. Right. You know? Right, yeah. Great answer. <laughs> hey, man, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Very special thanks to Dustin Hartman uh, for uh, press promotion for arranging this interview with Mark Stein. Uh, the Van Vanilla Fudge, the new album is called Vanilla Zeppelin, five stars. You can purchase it now. Oh, no, it's uh, available in November, I believe, right? It's not out yet? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, coming out, but it's remastered, so I, it it's probably has been out there before. Uh, you can also purchase Mark Stein's first book, uh, You Keep Me Hanging On, everybody buy that. It's available on Amazon and, and also at Barnes & Noble, um, and also, of course, your solo album as well, which is a great album. And uh, I think your solo album is available on Amazon as well, is that right? Right, so it's available wherever you buy contemporary music today, you know. Right. And you can, you can it, yeah. for more information, go to Mark Stein's uh, official website site. Uh, Mark, it's mark-stein.com. Mark-stein.com. Uh, well, you can go to vanillafights.com, too, because we all share right. our solo projects on, on the mothership there. Yeah. And you're on Facebook, you're on uh, Twitter, and you're on Instagram as well. And I'm 
on my couch right now. And you're on your couch right now, still recuperating from uh, the flu. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark, good, good talking to you again, man. It's always a pleasure. Hey, man, appreciate, appreciate you keeping up the, uh, the light on all, uh, all these classic rock cats like myself and everybody. And I uh, hope to talk to you soon, all right? All right, do some more solo stuff, man. I love it. It's coming, man. All right, appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. All right, take care. Bye.